Okay, a pleasant good evening to everyone. And I hope that you all had a wonderful day. Um, to those that have had have an opportunity to say Happy New Year too, I'd just like to wish you a Happy New Year and wish God's richest blessings um, upon uh, your life as we um, face a brand new year. And uh, may all the challenges that are ahead of us um, be um, such that they will draw us closer to Jesus Christ and strengthen our faith. And that we know that as we continue to dedicate our lives to him and continue to um, put our hands in his hands, we know that we are going to be able to have a successful 2022. Um, once God is, um, as the Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? So we need not fear what is ahead of us for the new year. Um, the same God that has been with us during 2021 is going to also be with us as we go through this new year um, as well. So I just like to encourage us to remain faithful and to remain um, trusting, knowing that God will continue to, um, to, to be with us and to, and to guide us in the way that he will have, have us to go. Um, of course, um, this is a year of evangelism, is a year uh, where the uh, Inter-American Division is celebrating um, its 100th um, year um, anniversary. And that is indeed a milestone. And, you know, every time we, we celebrate these kind of anniversaries, it is with kind of a mixed feeling because, um, you know, having the church here for 100 years um, is not really something to celebrate about. We want to see, we want to see Jesus come, don't we? And so when we celebrate centennials and 200 years and so forth, um, it's time to celebrate, you know, because God has been with us. But at the same time, you know, it's like we're getting tired of this whole earth. We want to see Jesus to come. So, um, so hopefully there would not be a 200th, you know, anniversary of the Inter-American Division, but uh, we will be celebrating that in, um, in heaven. Um, but yet we want to thank God that he has been with the Inter-American Division. Of course, the North Caribbean Conference and the Caribbean Union is a part of the Inter-American Division. And of course, um, our um, territory as well to is a part. So we celebrate. And but as I said, we celebrate with uh, mixed, uh, we celebrate with mixed feelings. Okay. Um, so this evening we are going to um, go into our evangelistic um, program. And it's the beginning of the year. Um, so I want to, you know, have an opportunity to challenge us as we um, go through this new year to um, continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, um, Jesus Christ. And, um, and I, I hope that, you know, by the end of the presentation um, this evening, that it will challenge us, you know, to do thus, to continue to grow um, in grace and to grow in, in um, and, and to grow in grace and to grow in, in, in um, closer, okay, to grow closer um, to, to, to Jesus Christ, okay? Um, at this time, I'm just going to ask if um, Pastor Bevans, if our senior pastor, Pastor Bevans, could um, prefer us at this time. Good evening. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, this evening, we just want to give you thanks for the privilege, the opportunity that you have given us to come before you to worship you and to fellowship and also to hear your word. I would like to ask, Lord, that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness, anything that is unlike you, and I pray that you place your spirit in the heart of each worshiper present. I pray that you be with uh, Pastor Edward as he presents your word, and I pray that you continue to be with each of us as members of your church, that we might strive by your grace to be our best selves and also to, by your grace, to receive from your table so that we can be transformed. The challenges we face as members of your church and also as individuals living here on planet Earth, we place everything in your hands and we're asking for your intervention uh, for those who are sick, those who are in their hospital beds, those who are quarantined at home, and those who 
uh, have some type of ailment, we pray that you visit them and place your healing hands upon them. Lord. Those who are mourning, we beg that you comfort them. And those who are looking for truth, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you might use us as vehicles so that we can carry your word to a dying world. Thank you for hearing us and blessing us, and thank you for allowing us to uh, worship you this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Um, um, thanks very much. Um, okay, Pastor Bevans. Okay, and um, at this time, we're going to go in our um, the presentation that they have for us um, this evening. And I, you know, pray that um, God would indeed uh, make it a blessing to um, our hearts um, this, um, this evening. Um, okay. Okay. Let me just share that screen at this time. Okay, and, and this evening I would like to um, do a presentation about how we can be spiritually strong, how we can grow spiritually strong for, um, for, 2000, for 2022, for 2022. Um, how can we really, you know, grow strong? How can we grow strong in the faith? How can we make sure that we are, you know, that we're not going back, but we're going forward, that we are climbing Jacob's ladder, that we are, you know, continuing to grow stronger and stronger in, you know, in, in, in Jesus Christ. And um, that is, in, it, it is in so, it's so important, you know, Sister White, you know, has a, a quote, you will see it was shared on WhatsApp that says that every year we should actually be checking our, um, you know, be checking our growth. We are supposed to be able to look back at 2021 and ask ourselves the question, uh, have I grown in my spiritual experience? Um, have I, what did I learn new about God? What, what did I learn new about Jesus Christ? Uh, maybe last year, maybe the year before, I didn't um, take a lot of time to study God's word. I, I came to Sabbath school and I was not able to say that I studied because, you know, I was kept, I, 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 I didn't put a lot of time into my devotional life. And so the beginning of the year is an opportunity for us to look back at the year that is past. And of course, it's a time when a lot of people make resolutions, you know, they make resolutions with regard to um, how they would like to improve um, in, this, um, in this coming year. So um, this evening, I would like to do a presentation on how to grow, how we can grow um, spiritually strong. Now, there are a lot of people who are concerned about physical strength and, um, you know, the exercise and they join the gym and they make sure that um, they, they keep up with their routine because they are concerned about, by their, about their physical strength. I mean, uh, even people who are in the senior years, I see many people, um, you know, they're doing walks, or maybe they're part of a gym, or, you know, they exercise at their own rate, something that is befitting of their age. But we're all concerned about our physical strength. I, I always love to go back to the book of Genesis, and there in the book of Genesis, uh, we have a lot of lessons. In fact, I always um, say, and I've heard it said as well too, that all our teachings can be found, all the 28 fundamental beliefs um, of our church can be found in the book of Genesis. So Genesis is very foundational. And interestingly, Genesis is under attack, especially the first 11 chapters of Genesis is under attack. The devil doesn't like the book of Genesis. And um, even Christians today, many evangelical Christians today, they are claiming that Genesis 1 to 11 is, a, is an allegory that is not real, you know, that Adam and Eve weren't real, you know, the flood was a local flood, you know, and so forth. But I love to go back to the book of, of um, Genesis, because here we are told about how mankind was made, how man was made. Genesis 2 and verse 7 says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Notice says that man became a living soul. What made man a living soul? The breath of God, uh, the breath of God and the, 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 the dust of the earth, both came together and made a living soul. Man became a living soul. So the dust plus the spirit um, equals to a living soul. So the elements of the earth plus the breath um, gave a, made a living creature. 
Now, life is a mystery because um, you um, you have a loved one at the hospital and they tell you come as soon as possible because your loved one is about to die. And you're in that room and you see that person take their last breath. And after that person takes their last breath and that life leaves them, there's nothing that could be done to bring that life back to that person again. Once somebody is dead, there's nothing that can be done outside of God himself that could bring life to that person. Now, the question is then, the, 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 the question is then, what, what, what is it then that um, is, what is it that the body doesn't have anymore because all of the physical part of the person is still there. All their cells have the same um, uh, matter. The brain cells are there. I mean, the heart, the blood, everything is there. When that person leaves, um, the, the, when the breath leaves that person. But yet, that person is what? That person is dead and nothing can come back. So life is a mystery. You know, what is really life? You know, only God can really define what life is. You know, life comes um, from God. Now, uh, why am I going back to Genesis and looking about how man was made and the fact that we are made as a physical being, but we are also a spiritual being? Well, because we make the same idea again in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Uh, we just finished in our Sabbath school in the book of Deuteronomy. So this is a text that we would be familiar with. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3 says, And he humbled thee, speaking about the children of Israel, and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by what? By bread alone, but by what? But by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of the Lord. So here we see therefore then that um, um, God is here telling the children of Israel that um, the, God deliberately carry the children of Israel through the wilderness to teach them an important lesson. He took them to a place that was a dry and dreary land so that they might be hungry and thirsty and they might look to him so that they might be taught the lesson that you don't live by bread alone. So it's interesting in indicating that um, God caused the children of Israel to be, to be hungry he deliberately led them to the wilderness so they could be hungry because he wanted it to teach them a lesson. You know, isn't that interesting? So God caused the children of Israel to be hungry so that they might desire food. Why? So that they might learn the lesson that they do not, they do not only need food. They also need something else more than food. <laughs> That's interesting. You know, I'm told that Socrates, the great philosopher, Greek philosopher, would take his students to, hit, to the riverside, and he would push their head under the water. And when they start gasping for breath, when they just start gasping for breath, he would bring their head out of the water and he said, you see there, the way in which you were grasping for breath a while ago, that is how you're supposed to desire and love learning. <laughs> so, I, so that is what God is doing here. The Bible says saying that God led the children of Israel through the wilderness to make them and cause them to be hungry so that they might learn the important lesson that they do not need bread alone, okay? That man shall not live by um, bread alone. Now, um, in John chapter four, we find this story of the woman at the well, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Of course, the Bible tells us that Jesus was by the well, it was midday, and this woman of Samaria came with her water pot and she came to, you know, to, to get water. And in their conversation, John chapter 4, verses 24, in their conversation, you know, when Jesus asks her for a drink, and she says, you know, why are you asking me for a drink? You are a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. And the conversation continued until we reached to John 4 and verse 24, when God told her, when Jesus told her that God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in what? In spirit and in truth. So it means, therefore, then that we are physical beings. We need bread, but we shall not live by bread alone because we have to realize that God is spirit and we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, then, we are more than our parts. We are more than the sum of our parts. So this evening, I would like to share with us six dimensions of the spiritual life 
that we have to make sure that we, um, we, we, are, we, are, we are growing as a balanced being. And that is why I have this, this, this wheel here. All of these is like the spokes of a wheel. Um, number one, the aspect of the dimension of holiness. Number two is the contemplative life. The next three is the incarnational life. Number four is the charismatic life. Then we have social justice, and then we have the evangelical. So all of these are different aspects of our spiritual being. And it is important for us to know that we are growing as a balanced individual, that we are growing in 2022 as a balanced um, being. So I, I, I place this um, wheel here because you know what happened if one of these spokes is out of the wheel and the wheel get bent, you know, then after the ride becomes bumpy, you know? So in order for us to have a balanced wheel, in order for us to have a balanced life, in order for us to make sure that we have um, a balanced spiritual life, then we have to make sure that all of these different six dimensions of our spiritual life are going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, are parts of our, you know, uh, are part of our uh, given attention um, in, in, our, in our spiritual growth. So number one we're going to look at is holiness. And what do I mean by holiness? Holiness is having pure thoughts, words, and actions, and overcoming temptation. That's what I mean here by holiness. Having pure thoughts, words, actions, and overcoming temptation. What does the Bible say? Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1 tells us, about the experience of Jesus in the wilderness. It says, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones be made what made bread. Huh? But he answered and said, it is written. Uh, we just read that in Deuteronomy chapter eight and verse three. What? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Where is Jesus Christ? He's in the wilderness. Huh? And here he's now using a wilderness passage. So again, the Bible tells us that the spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to do what? To be tempted of the devil. And what lesson is Jesus learning? The Bible tells us that Jesus learned obedience. What lesson is Jesus learning? Jesus is learning the lesson that man shall not live by bread alone. So in other words, then, when we have prayer and fast, why do we fast? We are fasting to remind us that we do not live by food alone. <laughs> we also live by the spirit. We also need the spirit. So here Jesus is in the wilderness, just like all the children of Israel were in the wilderness, and he's quoting a wilderness passage to the devil, to remind the devil, I'm here, I've been fasting for 40 days, and I'm learning the lesson that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word um, that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And, and, and the word that is used there for word in the original um, is daba in Hebrew. And daba actually means word or thing. Okay, so when it says, um, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God, it, it originally says, but by everything that proceeded in the the translator says word, but you could say also everything. So in, 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 in other words, then, uh, what the passage is saying that we do not live by just eating, that is the physical being, but we also live by the thing that came out of the mouth of God. That points us back to where? Genesis. Because in Genesis, we are told what? Man was made by what? The breath of God and the dust. So we are physical being and we are spiritual being. So when the Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, it is not only talking about saying that we also need to study the Bible. Yes, that is true. But it is also saying that we live by the breath, the thing that came out of God's mouth. What is the thing that came out of God's mouth and went into the nostrils of Adam? That was what? That was the breath of God. So it is saying that we do not only live by bread alone, but you and I also live by the breath, the breath that came from God's mouth, okay? And so it, again, it is indicating we are spiritual beings. He said, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if you are really the son of God, just throw yourself down for it is written, notice now, 
First, Jesus used scripture to quote to the devil. Now the devil is using scripture. In other words, the devil is saying, you think you're the only one who can quote scripture? I can quote scripture as well too. He says, the son of man cast thyself down for it is written, he shall give his angel charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest thou, thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, it is written, the word of again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. <laughs> Ouch. In other words, then, um, Jesus was telling um, Satan, I'm the Lord. I'm your Lord. I'm your creator. <laughs> again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and show him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leave him, and behold, the angels came, and they ministered unto him. So we see therefore then that Jesus was able to resist temptation. He was able to live the holy life by doing what? By resisting the temptation. And what did he use? He used the weapon of the word of God. He hid the word of God in his heart so that he may not sin against his God. So how, let us look at some practical ways in which how we can practice holiness in, in, in this new year. One, I can pray for the Holy Spirit to purify our, our hearts. And then listen. That's a very important part of prayer. A very important part of prayer is to listen. Just, not just pray and get up off our knees, say amen and get up off our knees. But in our personal prayer time, we not only pray to God, but we listen. And we'll hear his voice speaking to us. Next. We can respond to temptation with the word of God the same way in which Jesus did. So when we are tempted of the devil, we too can quote the word of God. And I'm telling you, I think it is Hebrews 4 and verse 12 so that God's word is like a sword. It is quick and powerful. There's nothing more powerful even to answer someone, um, you know, who, who challenge you with some question. You quote the word of God. There's nothing more powerful than the word of God. And I always try to do that. When someone asks me a question, if there's a passage of text, a passage of scripture that I can use in order to, um, in, in order to answer that person, use that passage. Then we can try a 24 hour partial fast, okay? Partial fast mean uh, you can fast for me what your favorite you know, meal is. Daniel had a partial fast where he says he fasted from everything that was dainty, you know? He fasted from his favorite food. You can practice stem in the tongue. Huh? That is also kind of fast as well too. You know, as human beings, we are guilty of being quick to speak ill of others. And we are very slow to speak well of others. So we can practice stem in the tongue. In other words, go a day without saying anything negative or dishonest. So I get up this morning and say, you know, it doesn't matter how I'm tempted. It doesn't matter how somebody annoy me. It doesn't matter how I see someone act or behave. I'm going to go through this day and I'm not going to say anything negative about anyone. Someone might upset me by a post they put on social media, on Facebook or YouTube, or send something about to WhatsApp to me, but I'm going to practice taming my tongue for today. I'm not going to say anything negative or dishonest for this day. What are we doing? We are practicing holiness. Number two, we are looking at how we can develop spiritually in 2022. Number two is the contemplative aspect of our spiritual development. What do we mean by that? It means spending time with God in prayer and meditation. Spending time with God in prayer and meditation. We go again to God's word, Mark chapter 14 and verse 32. It says, and they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And speaking of Jesus, he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be so amazed and to be very heavy. And said unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Stay here, wait here, and, 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 and watch with me. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, means father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And so we see Jesus here in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's doing what? He's praying. The cross is before him. It's an ordeal. Um, he, the, the cup is trembling in his hands. 
and he knew he knows that he has to drink from that cup. And what is what we find him doing? He is with his disciples and he is there praying. Of course, they are sleeping, but he is there praying. So we need to, just like Jesus, come apart, practice a contemplative life. How do I do that in a practical way? Make sure I can set aside five to ten minutes each day for prayer. Five to ten minutes, early morning, midday, on your lunch break. Just go outside and speak to God. Talk to him early in the morning. You know, sometimes I wake up in the morning to use the bathroom, maybe four o'clock, three o'clock. I kind of go back to sleep, get back to sleep early, um, um, easily. What I do, I study and I meditate. I can hear God speaking to me. God, I think God speaks to us in a special way, you know, early in the morning. You know, you get up in the morning early, whether you're getting up to rise or to use the bathroom, whatever the case might be. But you get up early in the morning, you can spend some time there and, and speak to God and hear him speak back to you. Set aside that time each day for prayer. Spend five to 10 minutes each day in silence. I remember when I was at Andrews University in seminary, um, I had to do a course called Spiritual um, Formation. And um, part of the exercise, one of my assignments that I had to do, I had to go to a spiritual retreat. I think it's called Still Waters there in Barron Springs, Michigan. And um, we had to spend, uh, I think it was a weekend. It was a class assignment. And me and some other seminary students had to spend a weekend there. And, you know, it was something like a bread and breakfast. You know, you had your own bed and so forth and, you know, and so forth. And they provided, you know, lunch for us. But the very first exercise we had to do that Friday night was as soon as we got there, we got there maybe like five o'clock or so. And then um, the, from sunset, we were instructed by the leader of, this, of the retreat. We were told that we could, not, we could not talk to each other. We could not speak at all, <laughs> OK? Or until it was time for us to go to bed. So, I mean, it, that was strange because we were all there as students for that Friday evening. And that was the exercise we had to do. We had to go through an exercise of silence. And I mean, try it sometimes. Maybe try it with your family or something. I mean, when I say silence, I don't mean that you're looking at television or you're on your phone or you're on YouTube. No, you are just with your own thoughts. You're not doing anything else. You're not reading. You're just silent. Spend time. And you will be surprised the things that come to your mind. You'll be surprised to know the things that come to your mind you know, if you spend that time in silence. But that was one exercise we do, and it was strange for us. Um, next, you can read a selection from a devotional book. And many, many of us do that in the mornings when we get up in our personal devotion. What about praying the same prayer for 10 minutes um, each day? Maybe it's a loved one you're praying for. Pray for that person. Maybe you want to see a loved one come to know the Lord and so forth. Pray that same prayer for 10 minutes. You know, 10 minutes seems short, but when you're praying, 10 minutes can be long. But pray, for, pray that same prayer for 10 minutes each day. And then you can also write a letter to God. Some might say, oh, no, how do you write a letter to God? Well, if you read the Psalms, the Psalms basically are like letters to God. The Psalms are basically addressed to God. And here you, you we, we read them today, but when we read them, we see how personal they are. We see the psalmist is crying out because he's confused, he's hurting, you know, and so forth. But that might be an exercise. You know, write, write a letter to God. Then number three is the incarnational. What do you mean by incarnational? Incarnational means unifying the sacred and the secular areas of my life while showing forth God's presence. You know, Jesus came, we are told that he, he, he came, we call it the incarnation because he came um, uh, uh, from, um, um, as God and he came as, a, he came as a man, right? He came from God. You know, he came from God and he came here into our world, you know, as, as a man. And um, so he became like one of us. So he was, he, he incarnated, okay? So you find the sacred and the secular areas of my life while showing forth God's presence. Let's look at see what that's done. Speaking of Jesus, he says, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years and was bowed together and couldn't lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her he, called her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from the infirmity. And he laid his hand on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. They were angry. Why? Because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto people, 
There are six days in which men are to work, but why are you coming on the Sabbath day to be healed? Don't come on the Sabbath day to be healed. The Lord then answered him and said, thou hypocrite, don't you, each one of you, on the Sabbath day, loose your donkey and your ox from this stall and you lead them away so that they can get water? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all of his adversaries were ashamed and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Okay, so what is going on here? What is going on here? We see here, therefore, then that Jesus is healing this lady that has been bound by the devil for such a long period of time. And the Pharisees were upset because Jesus healed her on the Sabbath. So as far as they were concerned, healing should have been done other days, not on the Sabbath day. In fact, uh, we are told that the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they had a policy that, that, that um, on the Sabbath, an emergency healing could have been done, but not any other kind of healing. So in other words, then, if you got a cut, if you cut your wrist, it was okay to bind your wrist so that you wouldn't bleed to death. But if there's another illness that you had that is not an emergency, you don't need to go to the emergency room, then you're not supposed to attend to it on the Sabbath. So that is why they were accusing the woman and saying that you can come another time of the week. Why are you, why are you healing on the, on, on the Sabbath day? You could have done this yesterday or you could have waited tomorrow. I mean, she has been sick for so, so many years. Why do that on the Sabbath? So here the scribes and the Pharisees, they were separating what? They were separating the spiritual, their spiritual life from their secular life. As far as they're concerned, the Sabbath had nothing to do with health and well-being, unfortunately. So how could I practice the incarnational life? Practicing the incarnational life means that I'm not only a Christian on the Sabbath. It means I'm not only a Christian when I'm in church. It means that wherever I am, I'm in the store, I'm on my job, wherever I am, people are supposed to be able to look at me and know that I am a Christian. In other words, then, that when I am, if you are, uh, if, if you are a mechanic and you're a Christian, it means, therefore, then, that you're not going to, um, you, know, you know, tell someone that you did some job on the care that you didn't do. Huh? Um, you're not going to um, say that you changed a part, but you didn't change a part. You know, you only, you know, um, repaired the part. Um, you are going to be honest. So that's what incarnational ministry means. Incarnational ministry means that my Christianity is going to flow out in my daily life. So how can I practice that? I need to take an inventory of my life. Again, I said, beginning of the year, 2022 is a good time for me to look back and see um, where I fell, where you know I could have done better and make a decision that this year is going to be my year. This year is going to be the year when I, 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 I do better. Number two, I can remove the barrier that keeps God on the um, the outside. What is what is a bad habit? Am I spending too much time on social media? Is it that I'm not studying my Sabbath school lesson? Is it that I'm not concerned with the program of the church? Is it that I'm not um, attending uh, attending you know um, 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 service? What is it? What is it? Whatever barrier it is that's preventing me from giving my all to Jesus, then is it a relationship, an unwise relationship? Whatever is barriers keeping me from God outside, remove that. You know, and I mentioned before, do your work in the honor of God. You know, always make sure uh, whatever you do, you do it with all your might. Whatever it is, it is not the job that we have. It's not whether we have a big job or a small job, but it's how we do the job. That is how God is going to, um, going to measure our success, how we do our job, not the kind of job that we had. And of course, part of the incarnation of ministry is um, receiving communion, um, being a part of the communion service. That is taking on the um, the 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 the, um, the life of Jesus Christ. Number four. Now is the charismatic. We are looking at all the different aspects of our spiritual being, our spiritual well-being. Next is the charismatic. What do we mean? In charismatic. Welcoming the Holy Spirit while nurturing and exercising my spiritual gifts. So I must know that if the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is there. Um, it's available to me. I'm going, I must nurture and welcome the Holy Spirit. When he's speaking to me and tell me, you know, what you're doing is wrong. I respond to, um, you know, I respond to that. 
and, and exercise my spiritual gifts. John 14 and verse 15 say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it saith him not, neither doth knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So how do I practice the charismatic life? Number one, I yield to the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, in other words then, the Holy Spirit is telling you something, then afterwards, you know, you respond to that. You know, I remember while I was doing my last evangelistic meeting, there was something that was on my mind. Every time I go to pray, there was something that was on my mind, you know. And um, eventually, you know, I had to, 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 to call a brother, you know, I had to call a brother in the church and say, you know, um, you know, such and such is the case. This thing has been coming before me. And he said, you know, pastor, it's no big deal. And so forth. I say it might not be a big deal to you, but it was on my mind. Every time I pray, um, God brought this thing to my mind and I had to make sure that I was cleared. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, he, he, he brings to our minds and our memories places, you know, where we need to get things straightened out. And, and, and um, once that comes to our mind, we need to do something about it. We nurture the fruits of the, the, um, the, um, the, the Holy Spirit. The spirit, fruits of the Holy Spirit is love, um, um, gentleness, uh, uh, um, goodness, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and uh, all of those graces, we nurture those. And we also discover what our spiritual gifts are and make sure that we use, um, those, um, we use those spiritual gifts as well too. Number five is social justice. Number five is social justice. We are looking at how we can have a holistic development of our spiritual lives, social justice, helping others that are less fortunate than you, okay? Matthew 25 and verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats are gonna be on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. I was stranger, and he took me in. Naked, and you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you came to the hospital to visit me. I was in prison, and you came to prison to visit me. Then the righteous are going to be surprised, and they're going to answer saying, Lord, I mean, when did we see you hungry and give you food or thirsty and gave you drink? We don't remember doing that. <laughs> when, when did we see you like a stranger and took you in or naked and closed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and came to visit you? We don't remember that. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. So in other words then, how God evaluate, how we treat um, um, him is how we treat the least of our brethren. So as much as we might say we love God, we might think that we love God 100%, but if the person I, I like least or love least, I only love them 10%, this passage is telling me that I only love God 10%. So my love for God is not measured by how nice I feel and, 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 and how much I think I love him and I do him. No, my love for God is measured by how much I love the least of my brethren. That's the measure. Then he shall say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye curse, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Naked, you didn't give me any clothes. You're sick and in prison and you did not even visit me. And they're going to ask the same question, Lord, when did we see you in these kind of circumstances? Huh? And did not minister unto you. Then he answered them, 
Verily I say unto you, in as much as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it unto me. That's it. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So how we treat others, how we treat others who are less fortunate is how God is going to measure our love for him. The judgment is going to turn on the hinge of how we treat our fellow men. Not about the tithe we paid, not about the crusade we preached, not about of, of, of Bible studies we gave. No, oh, the judgment, huh? the judgment is going to turn on the axis of how we treated others, the least of these, my brethren. So how can I practice social justice? What, what about writing a kind and encouraging letter? Or oh, well, people don't write letters anymore. Maybe send an email. What about sending a, a WhatsApp message? Just an encouraging word. You might see somebody, they might look discouraged, they might go through a difficult time. Write a letter, send them a note. Let them know that you're praying for them. Volunteer to work at a local food bank or soup kitchen. You know, uh, when I was in Florida, um, when I was in Florida, I used to always be a part of the prison ministry. Even here, um, um, recently they closed on the prison because they, I think there was a, a murder at the prison, so we cannot go and visit anymore. But I, I was always part of prison ministry. Uh, when I was in Florida, um, there was a uh, there was a, 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 a shower ministry. The homeless people they had no place, of course, to take a shower. So um, there was a YMCA um, that would open um, every Sunday so that they could come and take a shower. So that was like my ministry. Every Sunday morning, I would go there and you know work with the homeless. We, you know, make sure they get a good shower. We gave them a change of clothing and gave them a track, you know, and um, so forth. But it's important for us to be involved in, in, a, in some way in which we are helping people who are less fortunate. Uh, we can, how do I practice social justice? I guard the reputation of another person. You know, you're in a conversation and you hear somebody speak unkindly about a fellow brethren or support, be the person to stand up and say, no, I don't think you should be saying something like that. You shouldn't be speaking about your brother in that way. You shouldn't be tearing on your brother in that way. Have you, have you spoken to the brother individually? Have you sp have spoken to them? A lot of times, you know, we kind of protect our own friendship because we don't want the other person to get upset with us. We don't want to seem like a sore thumb, stick out like a sore thumb. And so therefore we just go along. We may not add, we not, we may not, we may not add to the conversation, but if I'm there and I hear someone speaking ill of my brother and I do not say anything, I am just as guilty as that brother. I am also taking part in that. So guard the reputation of another person. Look for an injustice and address it. You know, you see something that is taking place in the community and so forth. Uh, maybe children are not being treated well or whatever it is, you know, see an injustice and address it. Do something about it. In other words, then basically um, find a place, you know, where you can take a stand. You know, there's so many people just, you know, go along, they see things that are taking place in the church and they are looking for the pastor, the new pastor to come and, you know, straighten things out. I mean, you've been there all the time for years and years and you see something around, take a stand, say something, okay? That is how you practice um, social justice. Then we come to our final aspect of spiritual development, the evangelical. And of course this year we are looking at the breaking the glass ceiling um, evangelistic program. So this comes in just in time, the evangelical. That's also part of my development. Why is that? Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and reading the scriptures. And we go back to the Bible again. It says, Luke 1, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That was like the Magna Carta of Jesus Christ. That was his mission. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and he sat down and all the eyes of the people were upon him that, that were at the synagogue at that day, they, they realized that something special had just happened. And when it was day, he departed and went into the desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him and stayed, and, and stayed him 
that he should that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. So there we saw that Jesus' mission was to preach and to share the gospel. And we also have a mission as well too. How can I practice the evangelical life? How could I develop that part of my spiritual, my spiritual um, being? Um, I can memorize scripture. Memorize scripture, you know, um, in, our, um, in my family, um, in my family worship, you know, I was, you know, mentioning, you know, how we expect the children to memorize their memory verses, um, but when it comes to the adults, uh, we, we have a memory verse, but, you know, we don't expect the adults to memorize the, the, the memory verses, um, you know, in that way, the memory text, you know, but that's a good practice of scripture, you know, to memorize the scripture. So, you know, 13 Sabbath, we have our children go up and they, and they repeat this, the, the scriptures. And we think that, well, when we're adults, we have graduated from that. Uh, I don't know how many of us have looked at sermons by Randy Skeet, Pastor Randy Skeet, very popular preacher on YouTube. And um, yeah, he, has, um, he, he just preaches his sermons straight from his memory. Whatever his scripture reading is, he just gives his scripture reading from memory. Whatever passages he has memorized, he has made it a, a, a aim in life to memorize God's word. So memorizing verses of scriptures is, um, um, is important so that we can be able to share the word for everyone that asks us a reason for the faith that is within us. Number two, read one of the shorter books of the Bible out loud. For example, um, for this quarter, we are going to be looking at the book of Hebrews. So one of the good exercises to do at the very beginning of studying a book is to actually um, take the book of Hebrews and just read it all the way through. And it would help you in your understanding of Hebrews. But that is also helpful as well, too. Uh, meditate on a passage of scripture that speaks about Jesus. Okay, maybe God go to the final chapters of Matthew. Um, read about his, his, his um, crucifixion. Meditate upon those. Look for an opportunity to tell someone about your faith. You know, we have opportunities day by day. We meet other people and so forth. And, um, and, and, and every time we have an opportunity, you know, to do so, let us do so. You know, sometimes I go on YouTube and I look for um, people who are maybe, basically maybe criticizing um, Ellen White or so forth. And I go and I, I answer them and I interact with them. I don't know them personally or whatever and so forth. But that is a way of, that's an opportunity that you have, you know, in order to share the word of God with someone um, else, even on social media. So you don't have to leave your home in order to witness to someone. Um, and we, of course, we can proclaim the gospel by our actions. The lives that we live day by day, people are looking at us. Um, as the song says, um, our lives often are the only Bible that some people would ever read. So there we have it this evening. We looked at the different six different aspects of our spiritual growth for 2022. Uh, we looked at number one, holiness. Number two, the contemplative life. Number three, the incarnational life, living out, you know, our, our, our religion, realizing that religion is not just singing songs about Jesus and going to, to, to church and reading the Bible and praying. No, people are supposed to see and feel my Christianity in my daily living, on my job, on the street, in the supermarket, at the park, at the beach, wherever I, I, I am. Be charismatic. Make sure that I'm listening to God's Holy Spirit as Holy Spirit speak to me that I'm using my gifts. You know, when we have an opportunity to use our gifts, we use our spiritual gifts. You know, social justice, that when we see things that are not right, we say something, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, about it, whether it is inside of church or outside of church. And of course, we look at the, um, you know, we look at the evangelical. Now, Dr. Herbert Jackson told a story to his mission class when he was a missionary, tell them that when he was a missionary in, in, um, in, in Africa, that he had a car that um, was hard to start. Well, it was a standard. You know, you can you could do that with, with automatic, you know. Um, so what he would do, the, he had a car and, and it would never start. So what he would do is always make sure that he park it on a hill and so, or, or, or park it on a hill or maybe leave it running if you're gonna go to a place for a short visit. And, um, you know, and of course, get someone to help him push it off. And as it goes down the hill, you know, start the car, you know, and then, you know, that's what you're able to pick up. He did that for two years. 
Oftentimes, he would make sure that he parked in front like a school. Then he'll get the children to come out and push it. So when he came, um, when he left, you know, he retired, and a new missionary came um, to replace him. He was now going through and explaining to the missionary, well, you know, now you're going to inherit this vehicle. I want to let you know that this vehicle, it doesn't start. Uh, what you need to do is make sure you park on a hill. And, you know, so he gave him all of the instructions that he was using in order to get the car started. And um, so the, 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 the new missionary opened, asked him to, you know, open the, 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 the bonnet of the car. And he took a look, you know, he took a look underneath the hood. And then he realized, wait, there was just a loose wire. Maybe there was a loose wire on the battery or something like that, but there was a loose wire. He twinkled and thing the wire, tightened that wire, and that was it. So imagine here that that missionary had had to deal with this car for two years, huh? parking on a hill, getting people to push him in order to get it started. Two years when there was only a loose wire. And the same thing applied to our spiritual life as well too. Many times in our spiritual life, the, the reason why the devil gets us down, the re reason why the devil trips us up, maybe if that there's just one aspect of our life is like that loose wire that need to be tightened so that the devil wouldn't um, um, make us his victim. Um, Jebby Phillips translation of Hebrews 1 and verse 19 says, how tremendous is the power available to us who believe in God. So the power of God is available to us. And so if we have difficulty as well to get in that start. Huh? If we have difficulty, then we also need to make sure that we are connected uh, with Jesus Christ. You know, the Alaskan moose, the Alaskan bull moose, what they do is that during the summer, they eat as much as possible. They eat, 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 eat. I mean, that's when the vegetation is available and they make sure that they grow their antlers. They make sure they grow their antlers because what? Mating season is in the fall. And it is the it is the bulls, huh? it is the bulls that have the biggest antlers and that has the strongest, um, you know, and they are the fittest and they are the biggest, have the biggest muscles and so forth. They are the ones that are going to win all the girls. They are the one who are going to win all the ladies. And it means therefore then that they have to eat as much as possible during the summer. So by the time the fall comes around. Down, and the snow starts um, falling. No, when mating season comes. Well, if they didn't eat well during the fall, during the, the, the summer, then what? They are going to lose the battle during the fall. Huh? So in other words, then the victory of the Alaskan moose is not, is, is, is not determined in the fall when they're fighting. The victory is determined in the summer when they are eating and when they are preparing. That is what I call the bull moose principle, the bull moose principle. Enduring faith, strength, and wisdom for trials are best developed before they are needed. So in other words, then, we can't wait until the trials come to us for us to be prepared spiritually. No, we have to make sure that we are developing day by day so that when the trials and the difficulties come to us, that we are ready for them. So in other words, then, whether the trials um, this year get us down or not uh, is going to be determined by how we spent last year. And next year is going to be the same thing as well, too. If we live to, to see next year, next year, whether the trials keep us down or not are going to be determined by how we did this year. My prayer for us is that, indeed, we might develop that strength and have that, that, that courage. The ancient Greeks uh, made famous the Olympic Games that we are still using today. Huh? John Kelly, he ran 58 Boston Marathons, and the last one he ran was when he was 84 years old. Could you imagine that? 84 years old, he won, the, I mean, he, he ran rather, not won, but ran the, the Boston Marathon. Well, you and I, we are involved in a, a run. We are involved in a race. That race is the race um, for eternal life. And my prayer for us this evening is that for this year, 2022, that we may run a, victi a victorious um, race, that we might develop all of these different six elements of our spirituality so that indeed we might have the spiritual growth that God would like us um, to, um, to have, that we might indeed, um, the Bible says that we might grow in grace 
and in the power of his um, in the power of his Holy Spirit. Um, shall we pray at this time, our loving Father and our God? I uh, want to thank you for this opportunity that you have given us so that we can look at these six principles, these six principles of, 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 of um, different aspects of how we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we look at this, as we look at these different aspects, oh Lord, we are, we are stronger in some areas than other areas. So help, oh Lord, that as we investigate our own lives and where we are see we are missing and where we are failing, oh Lord, that by your grace and by your power, that we might gain the strength and the courage that we, uh, that, that we need um, so we might, we might develop holistically, that we may not be one-sided, but we might develop holistically because we know that the devil is looking at our weak spots. He's after our weak spots. He's just looking for a little emblem, a little place that he can he can puncture uh, our, 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 our wheels and, and, and get us uh, uh, um, you know, broken down spiritually. So we pray, O oh Lord, that you may continue to help that we might grow day by day and, and gain strength to fight the battle that we are about to face in this coming year. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Ray. Mm -hmm. This is your first sermon in Purcell. <laughs> uh, being an associate pastor of the district, I am sure that those of us that um, those of us that were listening in, connected, we surely received a blessing, and I pray that your stay in district number three will continue to be one that edify the brothers and sisters and help us prepare and be ready for the second coming of jesus so thanks once again and god bless you and um the brothers and sisters that are present we want to thank you amen uh, we want to tell that. Thank you for, you know, for yes, sir. The support. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. And may we continue to enjoy the evening, have a restful night. And I believe tomorrow is holiday still, no? Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> God bless and have a wonderful evening. Thanks again, so, Pastor Edwards. Pastor Edwards mm -hmm. is on for evening again, right? Yes, Wednesday evening, by God's name. <laughs> yes. Just God bless you too, Pastor Bevans. Amen, amen. Thank you very much, dear Sister Adams. <laughs> Blessings, man. <laughs>